Good morning and welcome to um, the Nebraska Library Commission's webinar on the new FCC Emergency Connectivity Fund. Uh, wonderful new acronym, acronym we have to remember and learn about, the ECF. Um, I am Krista Porter. I am the Library Development Director here at the Nebraska Library Commission. And I will be taking you through uh, the basics of this new program. Um, what we know now, uh, there are some things that are still um, unknown or uh, to be seen how things will look and how things will act uh, when you do have the ability to uh, apply for the emergency connectivity fund. So, um, but we'll try and give you all the basics that we can about it, everything that we that um, has been released from the FCC. Um, if you have any questions throughout the session, type into your question section in your GoToWebinar interface and I will grab them. If you have a microphone, type in, please unmute me. I have a mic and I will um, answer your question that way. Um, officially, we are scheduled, this uh, webinar is scheduled for an hour and a half. Um, but we will go as long as it takes to um, get through all the information I have here. The information I have won't take that hour and a half, but to answer any questions you guys may have. I won't cut things off um, just because if we reach the end of our official time, um, any questions you have right now that you're thinking of, I want to make sure I get them answered for you. So uh, let's get to it here. So what is this emergency connectivity fund that you've uh, heard about? Um, this is a new program, um, a one-time program. This is a one-shot deal. This is not going to be an ongoing program that comes up every year for you. This is um, a one-time program. Um, it is part of the American Rescue Plan Act, ARPA. Um, there's lots of funding opportunities and lots of money that is in ARPA, as you may have heard from all sorts of other resources and, and other um, money is being offered. Um, this particular one we're talking about um, today is um, money that was allotted to the FCC to help libraries and schools. It's $7.1 billion is has been allotted for schools, uh, specifically K through 12 schools and public libraries. And the purpose of this is to close um, what is known as and talked about as the homework gap or the connectivity gap. Those of us in libraries have known uh, for a long time that there is this um, gap of, of students and um, citizens not having adequate, adequate access in, for, to the internet at home. Um, the students, they have access to it when they're at school, and then as soon as school's out, they come to the library to use the internet there because that's where it is available in the town. Um, we've been dealing with this for years and doing and, and you know trying to come up with ways in public libraries to help increase our internet connections, increase the computers we have available to them to help these students and um, close that homework gap for them. Um, when the library closes at whatever time it does and they go home, then there's the what the schools refer to as that also that connectivity gap. Some people at home do not have an internet connection, do not have devices that are strong enough or um, updated enough to um, for the students to be able to do their homework or for the um, library patrons to do anything related to library services at home. Um, so we've known about this for a long time in the school and library world. Uh, co the COVID-19 pandemic has brought this to the forefront and got it in front of other people's eyes who have, are, are realizing, uh-oh, this is a thing. Um, people started working from home. Students started doing remote learning from home. And everybody suddenly discovered, oh, it doesn't work all the time, does it? The digital divide is even more obvious to everybody else now. So um, now with ARPA, the FCC has uh, $7.1 billion to help close this. And the official purpose there is that the last bullet there to provide adequate internet access and devices to library patrons. So anybody who uses a library and at, from a school, students and school staff who don't have um, access at home or at other off-campus locations, and we'll get into that. Uh, to be clear, I'm gonna, I wanna clear up some misconceptions or just com some confusion that may be out there about this. This is not E-rate. Um, you may have heard it called the E-rate Emergency Connectivity Fund. It, it is not E-rate at all. It is not an extension of E-rate. It is not, um, a replacement for E-rate at all in any way, shape, or form. Um, the E-rate and the Emergency Connectivity Fund are two completely separate programs um, with completely separate purposes related to each other, but separate. 
uh, they will the new in an emergency connectivity fund will how however will be administered by USAC, the Universal Service Administrative Company. For those of you who don't do E-rate, that is the company, the not-for-profit company that the FCC set up to run the E-rate program, which provides internet connections to schools and libraries, and then within the schools and libraries, um, getting that internet to uh, the computers or the devices, um, any of the uh, equipment and cabling and things internally in this library school building that they would need to do that. Um, because they uh, know how to do that and are good at it, the FCC said, USAC, you will also now run this new program, because it's similar. It's related, and you guys already know how to do this really well. So let's have you run this new program as well. Uh, the big difference between E-Rate and the Emergency Connectivity Fund is where this service and these devices can be used. For E-Rate, it's about bringing connections to the library and school buildings, and then within the building, making all those connections work. The Emergency Connectivity Fund is specifically for off-campus use, not in the library, not in the school. Um, in the order from the FCC, it does say these devices, this service and these devices are not to be used in the school or the library. They may have to bring them there and they may originally be checked out from those locations, of course, but the purpose of for their use is to get these internet services elsewhere in the community. Um, and it could be at home for students doing remote learning at home or library patrons just trying to do live, you know, access library services at home, but it can be anywhere. On school buses, Wi-Fi hotspots on school buses, if you have community centers or other shelters that, um, homeless shelters that need internet service for the community. Um, things that libraries may do, if you have a, a mobile, um, 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 the bookmobile, <laughs> um, book bikes, uh, pop-up libraries somewhere, anything and everything you can think of that's just not the library and not the school that needs a better internet connection, that's what the ECF is for. So that's a big difference between the two. E-rate is for in the schools and libraries, ECF is for outside and extending the school and libraries connections out. Um, but it is, it can get confusing, especially with them both being run by the same organization, <laughs> the same company, USAC. Um, but hopefully, uh, It'll become clear when you start doing it. <laughs> so who is eligible for these funds? Uh, this is specifically anyone who is currently eligible for E-rate support is eligible for the ECF support as well. Um, it's, you do not have to be currently participating in E-rate, so you don't have to be a current participant. That's not it. It's just if you're eligible to get E-rate, you can get ECF. Um, this is specifically um, for K through 12 schools only, so only up through that. So this does not go up to um, colleges and universities who can apply for this and public libraries. Um, an extra thing they've added to this one as well, um, tribal libraries historically in the E-rate program have been eh, maybe or maybe not. They are all tribal libraries are also eligible for this. The FCC has said this, let them apply as well. Um, here in Nebraska, specifically for public libraries, all pub that makes all public libraries are eligible. All, all public libraries in Nebraska, all schools and libraries, all public schools and um, K through 12 schools in, library in Nebraska are eligible for E-rate, so they are eligible to apply for this. <clears throat> Excuse me, if you um, are not a current E-rate participant, uh, you will need to create an account to use the new portal that's being created for the ECF. Uh, and we'll talk about how you do that in a little a little bit here. So um, current E-rate people, you're already good to go. New people to new new people to E-rate, you have to get set up to do that. So who is eligible to use these services and things that you do apply for these um, through the ECF? Uh, the purpose of this is for individuals who do not have internet access and or devices sufficient to meet their needs. So uh, this is about um, the, uh, the patrons or the school students or the school staff who are, um, as I mentioned, in need, they are needy. They do not have a strong enough internet connection or any internet connection at home, or they do not have a, a laptop or tablet at home that can be used um, to do the schoolwork. Uh, you know, as, as people went home, and over this past year and everyone was at home working uh the the need could be we just can't afford it 
or the need could be we have it but now that everybody's at home all at the same time multiple children using the internet service multiple adults working from home what we currently have no longer works it's no longer a strong enough or fast enough internet connection or we now don't have enough computers for everyone to do it because there's too many of us at home um, so your the need could be varying types of need not just um, uh, monetary need that we can afford it but everything changed and now we can't do what we need to do at home um, schools uh, and, and libraries will um, whoever applies to receive these this service from the school or library will sign off on a little document saying you know just uh, certifying yes I am in need um, you don't have to prove uh, uh, no requirement to, to prove um, give what the reasons are or say you know here's my um, income it doesn't work like that it's it's a sign this form you're legally saying you're needy that's all we need to know um the wording here now is also on the rest of the slide is specifically from the fcc order about this and i wanted to bring this to your attention because it is different from school to schools and libraries um for students and staff at schools it's for activities that are integral immediate and proximate to the education of students so if a student or a staff member says to the school, hey, I'd like one of these devices or I'd like to have this hotspot at my house, it has to be for using it at the, that location to do that remote learning or for a staff person to do their job from home, whatever they can do from home. For libraries, it's different. It's for activities that are integral, immediate and proximate to the provision of library services to library patrons. And that is for any service that the library offers, not just educational. So if a library patron comes into the library and says, I'd like one of those devices or that hotspot to bring home and use, um, it can be to you, the purpose can be to do anything that has to do with library services, logging into the library's um, catalog to look up books, to check out books, put books on hold, logging into the library's databases they offer, um, any other online services they may be offering that are library services. So that's a big difference between the school need, you know, purposes of using them and the library's purposes for using them. So libraries need to be very open in thinking with uh, more than schools of, of what um, their patrons can use this, the, the device or the hotspot or whatever they're putting out there um, for. Um, there's really no restriction on it. If it's a library service, it's something to do there that they're doing, they want to access that's the libraries, it's perfectly fine. Um, some of the things you may see that are talking about this talks about the ECF is for uh, remote learning and for education, and that is the basis of it. But the FCC, if you if you care to read the entire order <laughs> and you read up on that, they do spec, they do um, differentiate between how it is done through the schools and how it'll be done through the libraries and understanding that libraries have different services that they offer and this is what people coming to the library are perfectly um, allowed to do use this these services for anything they want um, what is L the equipment what can you get with this funding uh, something that is completely different from e-rate so anybody who's in e-rate in, in in the know of e-rate will notice this actual devices um, laptops and tablets. Um, in E-Ray, it's only for this internet service and anything that makes that internet service work. The cables, the routers, the switches, and all of that. Computers, tablets, all of those um, laptops were never, are not eligible for E-Rate funding. That is different for the ECF. They know people need the devices as well, or they need even a, just a better device than they might have. So, um, lap, any type of laptops and tablets. Smartphones and desktop computers are not eligible making that clear here. So um, yes, some people do use their smartphones to access things, some um, things that are the library website or, or school things. Uh, some people do have a desktop computer that they have or use. But for this particular purpose, it's about something that's more portable to carry around and go not just to home, but to a community center, to wherever they are out and about. So it specifically is to, for um, laptops and tablet com tablets. Um, also, Wi-Fi hotspots, you know, the hotspot lending programs that many libraries are doing now. This is another way to get some of those. Um, modems, um, and then if you're doing things in other locations, like setting up an internet connection at a community center or at a homeless shelter, um, whatever you need for that, modems, routers, and devices that combine those. So that is the equipment that is available. 
Um, the services are um, internet access services, so your internet connection, commercially available internet service. So any type of connection pretty much um, that's a good commercially available um, providing broadband, uh, DSL, cable, fiber, et cetera, et cetera. Um, just has to be commercially available out and about there. Um, any fees involved with setting it up um, are also can be covered by um, can, um, ECF funds can be used for. So that's installation, activation, any other pieces of equipment um, that might be needed for um, to get that internet access service set up wherever it's being installed. Uh, there is also a a little exception for new construction. Generally speaking, it's not for new construction. It's for um, just ex taking the library or the school's internet connection that's already there and extending it somewhere else, running a cable to another building or having um, you know, expanding out the, the, with the hot Wi-Fi hotspot, sending it home to someone. However, if there is no commercially available internet service available somewhere, then you can request use this funding to do new construction. Um, you must provide proof definitely very important that you have to prove, prove, prove that there is really nowhere else that we could get the service from at this particular off library and off school campus location. We have looked, we have searched, we have contacted um, service providers who are in our area and there just isn't an option. So um, for our very, very rural areas that we have, this may be the case sometimes um, that the internet's just run to the city buildings, but nowhere else. So if there is no, com in, no commercially available and you've got your proof piles of paperwork showing that you've tried, then you could have brand new construction done um, to set a brand new connection rather than just extending what is um, already available through at, um, from the school or the library. Now there are some, um, officially this is 100% cover it, um, of, of the cost is covered, but there are some funding caps that the FCC did put on part of this. Um, to for our laptops and tablets, uh, it's only up to four hundred dollars. Will they cover? You can buy something that costs more. Totally, you know, we know there are tablets and Chromebooks and, and laptops out there that do cost more than four hundred, but the ECF will only provide four hundred dollars worth of that. You would be responsible for the rest of it. Uh, for hotspots, they limit um, the funding cap is two hundred fifty dollars per hotspot. Um, that is for the device only, not the service. Um, the actual service plan would be part of the um, services part of it, which is covered by um, 100%. It's different. So it's just the physical laptops and tablets, up to $400 they will give you for them, and Wi-Fi hotspots, up to $250 for those. Um, there are some restrictions on how many of these can be given out to individuals. Uh, it's one laptop or tablet and one Wi-Fi hotspot per student a uh, school staff person or a library patron that requests one. So each individual can only have one um, of each of those. So you could get a laptop in a hotspot from the school um, for your student to take home. Um, an interesting uh, thing to notice here is uh, the SC does not limit, does not restrict um, duplicating borrowing these, <laughs> meaning uh, your student um, can go to the school and say, I need a tablet and I need a hotspot. And then the parent can go to the library and say, I need a laptop and I need a hotspot, both from the same program, but one the school applied for, one the library applied for, and it's perfectly okay, oh, perfectly okay for that household to have then two laptops and two hotspots in it um, because they came from the two different locations. The FCC actually did specify that it is perfectly okay that a you know, library patron may need one and a student may need one. So you could end up with that if both your school and your library in your community apply for this. For uh, the other services, everything beyond the actual laptops and tablets themselves and the Wi-Fi uh, hotspot itself, there is 100% reimbursement of reasonable costs. Reasonable cost is not defined. There are no rules yet of how um, what the speed must be, what the maximum they will pay. There's no budget maximum um, with E-rate, for those of you that know. And there's a limit to how much money each 
uh, location will get. There isn't any of that in this ECF. Um, it's going to be done on a case-by-case -case basis. When you put in your application, USAC staff will review it and decide what they think is reasonable, um, if you the amount you applied for for the internet service is reasonable or not, and we'll either give you the full 100% or we'll say, well, let's talk about this. It's, I think that's a little too much, or we'll give you part, whatever it comes out to be. So does anybody have any questions right now? Um, anything you want to know more, anything you um, are confused about or wondering about what the ECF is for, what you can apply for, um, what kind of um, the amount of funding you'll get. Anybody have any questions? Uh, type into the questions section of your GoToWebinar interface. I can see that here and I am monitoring that. Um, if you, oops, there we go. And I was going to say, if you do have a microphone, just let me know. And I'm just moving around my windows here so I can see what I'm doing. <laughs> and I can unmute you and you can ask your question um, that way. Where are you? There you are. Okay. All right. So, Cicely, I've unmuted you. You should be able to talk. Hey, yes. Thank you. you. Um, so, you were talking about funding caps. Uh, and the restrictions, so one laptop uh, and one hotspot per patron, and then my computer kind of went funky on your voice. So you said something <laughs> afterwards, and I wasn't sure, Are you ta is, does that include um, what's also currently, like if I have a student um, who, you know, who borrows a laptop and a hotspot from their school and then comes to the library and borrows another one, is that, does that matter? Um, I would that's the way you phrase it, I, I don't honestly I'm not sure because the way they phrased it is I would say yes um, okay. because it is um, and that's actually what is what I talked about right after that and it's probably what you mm -hmm. missed that um, one of the things that interesting about this is that the FCC has said that it is okay to duplicate borrowing these from this, if you have an you know, your library like the, the parent at the home and a student student goes to their school and the parent goes to the library and they both ask for a laptop and a Wi-Fi hotspot and both bring those home and you end up with two laptop two laptops and two hotspots that is okay yes um okay you said specifically if the student goes to the school and then the student goes to the library um i would say yes too in the fcc i'm just thinking of it through as you asked it that way sure. the, you know, the fcc and the usac are using the phrase library patron students can be library patrons too so uh right. yes um so yeah so the max well per person one laptop and one hotspot per person so but there's no limit per household how many can end up there right. um so uh well well that makes it easier so we don't have to like connect with the school to see if they are they, they already are borrowed a laptop okay. yeah. and yeah. yeah. So that works. Okay. And it only, you know, and you'd only even even get into this if both the library and the school, because this is a separate thing. Schools and libraries right. each apply for this. Do they each even apply for this funding at all? Yeah. Right. And then you would get into that. Yep. Yep. Okay. Absolutely. Thank you. Um, and let's see. Okay, I got lots more questions coming in here. Let me check off the ones we got here. Um, Okay, question. Um, someone has been in and out, popping in and out. Are community colleges eligible? Um, unfortunately, no, not for this program. Um, the um, e ECF, the Emergency Connectivity Fund, is specific specifically for K through 12 schools and public libraries. So um, nothing above grade 12, um, if you're teaching anything above that, is not eligible for this program. Um, for people who are attending the community college, like if you have students who are attending your community college that need a device or a hotspot to use at home, I would send them to your local public library to get it from there, because then they could use that to then do community college work if they wanted to, um, if that's what they need it for. But the community college, no, is not eligible to apply. Um, oh, well, uh, Oh, Tammy, interesting. Okay, um, 
reading the questions here. The question is, can several household members or bus riders, you know, wherever you have it, use one hotspot at once? Um, that would depend on what hotspot, how good a hotspot you purchase, but yes, um, hotspots can have multiple people on them at the same time. Um, it would just depend on um, how strong a hotspot you have and how strong the internet service is that you have to that location. Uh, all right. Ah, oh, and okay, so I see a comment here. I'm kind of jumping down here because we've got a comment from Gail about the, the library and the, just having a student check out from the library, from the school, and then the, the library. Um, a public library, yeah, um, Gail's right, would not know if a student checked one out from the school, and that's not something you need to worry about. No, you're just dealing with your patrons, what they want, the school's dealing with the students, what they need, and um, yeah, there doesn't need to be any, as you mentioned, Cecily, any. Uh, coordination amongst them, no. Um, let's see what else we got here. Will they allow cellular carriers for hotspots? That is probably all that would be available or work here. Oh, yes, um, like data plans and cell, yes, the, the, cell, the, the, um, the cell phone, the cell carriers that whatever, whatever kind of connection you get for the hotspot, um, that, that is what you could, you could apply for that as, the, as your service, absolutely. Um, air cards, things like that. And Jeannie says duplication there in different plans. Oh, you're talking about the school and the library each having their own internet connection, internet hotspots. That's true. They're going to be different plans entirely. What you get from the school and the library, because the library will, the school will contract with somebody to provide their hotspots and their service, and the library will um, contract with somebody and have a different account. So it will be two separate plans. Correct. And. Um, I see your question, Donna, and I am going to get to that. So I will hold off on answering that right now because I do have a slide all about that that we are going to talk about. Any other questions anybody has right now about what's available and what you can do? Yes. A few more things we will still discuss. All right. Where are we at here? Funding caps. Okay. All right. So. On to the application process. Uh, we know some about this. We don't know or have access to as much as I would like. <laughs> uh, so um, let's see, we'll give you what I got here. <laughs> so the filing window for this opens next week, June 29th, Tuesday, 9 a.m. Eastern Time, which is um, 8 a.m. for us Central Time, uh, 7 Mountain. Mountain. Um, and we'll close on August 13th at almost midnight Eastern time. Uh, this is similar to the, um, the way E-rate works. So it's a 45 day filing window to apply for this funding um, opening up starting next Tuesday. Um, this is going to be for future purchases only to start with. So this is you're thinking about things that we need for the upcoming summer and the upcoming school year you know, next year. So for anything you buy between July 1st of this year, 2021, and June 30th of 2022. Um, so, and it can be any time during that um, time frame that you make the purchases. Um, you just have to submit the application between June 29th and August 13th. August 13th is the deadline to submit an application or wanting the funding for things that you may purchase going as far forward as June, end of June of next year. Uh, this is something that was uh it changed from when the fc the this was this uh first came into arpa and the fcc first had their uh, put out their order and their questions for what people might want and you know, they whenever fcc does something there's always the comments that you can put into it and lots of organizations schools libraries will comment on things they do related to this uh originally this was going this was thought it was going to be a retroactive type thing uh because it's in response arpa and this funding is in response to the COVID 19 pandemic uh, we were uh, uh thought it would be we know you've already bought some, a lot of you have bought this from already, bought these things already last year and did not have grants or funding that you used it for. You could get reimbursed for things you'd already purchased. However, when the final rule came out, the FCC switched it all around and said, nope, first window, it's going to be for future purchases. Let's get things going for what's coming up in the next school year. So this is, you cannot submit, um, use this funding for things you've already bought any before July 1st. However, 
if there is still funding remaining after this first window, they um, may open, I should say may, um, a retroactive application window allowing you to apply for funding um, starting as far back as March 1st of 2020 uh, when right about when everything started locking down and going through June 30th of this year. So uh, we'll see how much money is left of that 7.1 billion after the first go around. Um, and if it is, then you will be able to apply and get reimbursements for anything you didn't, uh, that you'd purchased previously. Um, now many people, if you have applied for grants and things to us, the Library Commission or other places and had it already covered and that's fine. If you already got it paid for, you cannot get it covered again. You can't resubmit invoices for this. This would be for the retroactive one if it is able to be open for things you just had to pay outright by, for with library funds and did not have any other uh, source of funding that paid covered it for you. Um, oh, and we have some questions came about this, so I will actually answer these now as I'm seeing these come in. Yes. Um, that. How long will they fund the cost of monthly service for hotspots? This would be through that June 30th, 2022. So this is, um, that would be how long this would cover for you. Anything beyond that um, would be then for you to continue it afterwards. Um, this is a, as I said in the beginning, it's a one-time program for a specific reason because of COVID and it has a limited lifespan, I suppose I can describe it as. So uh, the cost of the monthly service would be through that June, end of June of 2022, they would cover for um, anything you purchase from this of, of services. Um, ah, Tammy, would museums be eligible? Um, museums would not be eligible this unless they are like a, a public library slash museum type thing. Um, and we specifically, it's, you have to be a legally established public library in Nebraska. That's the kind of key that this is. So it's not um, for uh, just, just museums, no. It's really specifically K through 12 school, schools and public libraries, and that's it. <clears throat> All right, so the application process, the window opens next week. Um, there will be a special um, emergency connectivity fund portal, the ECF portal that is not available for you to use or see yet. This is one of the things I wish we had right now. Um, I have not even seen, um, and I'll be honest with you, I have not seen even any screenshots or demos of what these forms will look like. Uh, We've asked about that and it's like they're working on this like right up to the minute of opening the window, um, USAC is, so uh, they did not want to share any sort of like here's a draft version of it because things could change at any time between now and next Tuesday morning. Um, so we don't know exactly, but um, it's going, it is going to be a modified version of the current E-rate form, the 471. Uh, for those of you not um, aware of what e -rate, how E-rate works. The 471 is a form where you let USAC know who you have chosen for your service provider and what services you'll be getting from them. Um, it is the second form in the E-rate process. For the ECF process, it's the first form. It's, it's, they're doing it differently. Uh, for um, the Emergency Connectivity Fund, there is no competitive, there are no competitive bidding requirements, meaning you do not have to um, put out saying you're looking for a, serv for a service or looking for someone to buy this from and then receive bids and then decide if you're gonna go with. You, get, you skip that completely. So for those of you in E-rate, no 470, no comparing. All it is is you, you just do the 471 saying, I want to buy some laptops and I want to buy them from this company. Or I want to get um, internet service and for this, um, from this particular company, you just start right off with that. Um, after, and then um, USAC will evaluate your application, maybe ask you some questions, might be some back and forth, and what, if they've approved it, then you will have also modified versions of E-rate invoicing forms to then receive your funding. You can either get the reimbursement if you're paying your bills in full, or get a discount on your bills when you receive them from your service provider or whoever you purchased the laptops and equipment from. Um, and there's two different versions, two different forms depending on your situation, the 472, the bear form for reimbursements, that you would submit and the 474 is the SPY form, service provider invoice is what that's for, that your service provider would submit to USAC. So they are taking the 
E-rate, as I said in the beginning, FCC knows, E-rate knows how to, how to distribute this kind of money. So they're taking what they've been using for E-rate, modifying the forms to fit the ECF program. Um, it will not be through the same interface that you use to do E-rate. It's a whole new portal that they are, have created specifically for this purpose. Uh, all right, we have a question I will jump back to now before I go ahead, because I want to make sure I grab it while we're still kind of close to that. Uh, question about purchasing laptops. It is up to four, is it up to $400 per laptop or just to purchase one laptop only? Um, you can purchase as many laptops as you want and you will receive $400 per laptop. So um, the idea of this program is to think about how many laptops do we think we might lend out for this purpose for people to use at home. And you'd use your statistics that you know, um, inquiries from lot from um, patrons. Uh, schools will know pretty easily. We have this many students. We know which ones need, you know, uh, laptops at home. So we need to a lot that we need to purchase that many laptops. Um, some of our schools already do that one to one, where they already provide their students with laptops or tablets. So that's covered. Um, they might just do the hotspots. We have, and this is a made-up number, so don't if I'm not, you know. We have 500 students in our school. We need to purchase 500 hotspots to potentially send home. And you would get 250 for each of those hotspots. You can do that. Um, for laptops, you would decide how many do you think will, will loan out? 20? Okay. You can say, I want to apply for 20 laptops from the ECF portal, and they will give you um, $400 for, for, for each of those laptops. Does that make sense? So you're gonna to have to think before you apply for this, how many do we need? Because that's what it's gonna ask for. How many laptops you're gonna purchase in the next year for this reason, for this use? Now that's key too. This is for the laptops to lend out for people to use at home, not for people to use when they're in the library. Um, you may have that as a program too, that in order to um, have social distancing, I know a lot of libraries um, pulled out their desktops and had more, uh, laptops or Chromebooks so people could space themselves out and go elsewhere in the building. Um, that's okay. This money can't be used to buy laptops for that purpose. The whole purpose of this is we're lending them and you're taking them somewhere else to use them. Um, do, ah, awesome question, Katie, because I also mentioned that later. Do laptops and tablets have to be connected to internet service? No. Um, if you just want to provide the service of lending out devices and not a connect a, and also the hotspot for the service, that is perfectly fine. You can pick and choose. So you can just say, I'm just applying to have a bunch of laptops to lend out to people. We're not even, we don't wanna get into the hotspot and uh, data plan <laughs> uh, issues at all. All right, and now Donna, here we have the answer to your question. Donna asked about SIPA, uh, Children's Internet Protection Act, one of our favorite topics, controversial topics sometimes. <laughs> um, so, uh, okay, hang on a sec here. We've got some. All right, let me go through this SIPA thing here, and then I'm going to jump back and grab your questions that you guys are typing in, because um, after this slide, I'm going to, we're going to kind of switch gears a little bit. So um, let me go through SIPA, and then I'll answer questions, and then any SIPA questions you might have, too. So let's do this. Uh, so, so SIPA is the Children's Internet Protection Act. Um, if those of you who have been involved in E-rate or in any, any money you've received from federal funding, like when we give out grants from IMLS, um, LSTA funding um, requiring having filtering on your, your internet service that you were um, if you're getting an internet service that is paid for with federal funding or um, buying a computer that will then from a grant we might give you that will then use the internet that, that, that the money is coming from a federal program you have to have um, filtering on these computers so SIPA only applies to the use of First of all, only the computers owned by the school or library, so not for any pers people's personal computers they might bring in. And only in this situation, if the school or library receives the ECF funding or E-rate funding for the internet access or internal connections. And this relates to your question, Katie, about can we just do laptops and not the internet service? Yes. Um, so if you are receiving E-rate, you're already filtering. If you're receiving E-rate for your internet, you already got this covered. 
if you're new to this whole concept and everything, you um, will need to be in compliance with SIPA having filters on your computers or on your internet service if you decide to use the ECF funding to buy anything related to getting internet service. However, it does not apply to computers if you're not receiving ECF funding or E-rate funding for internet access. So that's what's very important here. You can just purchase computers, laptops, tablets, and that's all, and don't have to worry about using this ECF funding and do not need to worry about dealing with SIPA at all. So if your library um, for schools, most of them just do this, so it's not an issue. But for public libraries, it does vary um, whether they uh, want to do filtering, um, agree that it's a good thing or uh, to do it all. Um, their board may not want it, their community may not want it. Um, it may be just something too hard for you to figure out and decide what do I use, what product, what service, how do I set it up, how do I monitor it, there's a lot that goes into it. If that's something you don't want to have to worry about, that is perfectly fine now. In this case, with emergency connectivity fund monies, you can just apply for money to buy laptops and tablets and stop there and you SIPA is not anything you have to worry about. However, if you do want to use this money to increase internet service, to get hotspots and service and or extend, um, you know, put service out into other area buildings in your community, then you're needing to be in compliance with SIPA. And um, we can talk more in detail about that if it does come up for you. Uh, there'll be some information about that from USAC as well, explaining more about it, but I have more information on our websites as well. So that is how SIPA works. Uh, now let me see here. Is it for your finance? Okay. Let's see. Okay. Let's see. Let's see. Okay. So Donna, does that answer your questions? Because <laughs> that is the um, the SIPA differentiation there. Um, hotspots are considered um, internet related and internal connection. So they, you are required for ECF, it's just computers that you don't have to have um, SIPA compliance with. Oh, Karen. Um, <clears throat> So, so hot, hotspots provide internet service. So if you're going to be purchasing a hotspot, you're going to be purchasing service. And in that case, yes, you would have to be SIPA compliant for what you're applying for. Okay, Karen, I'm jumping down to your second question that you just asked here, and I don't know. Uh, the question is, do Verizon or Mobile Beacon monthly services provide filters that qualify as SIPA? Oh. Oh, well, I can talk about what qualifies for SIPA as filters. Um, I don't know if Verizon, I don't know what Verizon or Mobile Beacon provide you for, uh, provide along with their service. So I can't say, um, answer it that way. But what I can tell you is um, that filters that qualify, um, there is not a list of filters that meet the requirements. It doesn't work that way with SIPA where they say, here's the ones you, here's the ones you have to choose from. Um, the way SIPA works is it has to be uh, something that block, that it's all about, SIPA is all about you know, Children's Internet Protection Act. It's all about pro, um, providing uh, blocking access to unsavory things on the internet um, to minors so that minors can't get to them, um, violence, pornography, whatever. Uh, the actual wording in SIPA states that it is to, it must block visual depictions of anything that would be harmful to minors. That's the wording. Um, so you know, you're talking about videos and things like that. However, in at this moment in time, we do not have any um, technology that can do that. That can only look at a visual depiction and know, oh, that's actually pornography rather than, oh, that's just a woman in a tan colored dress. We don't have the technology that can do that yet. So the filters that we do have look for websites, certain block, um, blacklisted websites or certain domains you know are bad or certain words and terminology that somebody might search you don't want them to look up. Um, anything that does that meets the criteria of, of SIPA and um, does work. Uh, what level of, of 
filtering you do is up to you at the library and your community. There's no rules about it must be at this high level or this, you know, these many things. Uh, there's no list of websites that must be blocked or um, don't, you know, that comes from SIPA or from USAC or from the government saying these are the ones. It's a very vaguely written law, which is good for us because at, it is, it actually says community standards will set the standard for what you filter for. So you can install filters on your computers or on your internet service or however you do it, put them to the lowest level possible of um, filtering, which may not block very much at all, and you are in compliance. Um, that would be for communities who we, I know some people do not like the idea of filtering or um, blocking anything at all, that it is censorship, that it is against intellectual freedom, that everyone should be able to access whatever they want. And um, I understand that, and that is a perfectly valid um, way to go. But if you want to get federal funding for anything that is internet connected, you need to figure out, and you want to really do that, you need to figure out how do I you do, how do we become in compliance with SIPA, but still make things as open as possible. And that is how you do it. Install the filters, get them on there, put them at the lowest level possible, and nobody ever notices, and you get your funding. That is how it works. Um, so as far as do Verizon or Mobile Beacon services provide filters that qualify, if they have filters that work, they would qualify. There's no list, I don't, and I don't know what they do, but if it's a filter and it does what it's supposed to, that would be considered qualifying under SIPA. Uh, let's see, we have some other questions here we're going to get into um, before we get to the last section of how you get uh, ready to participate and, and what we know you need to do to start participating in this program. Yeah, okay. So... Oh, okay, good question. Barbie has a question here, which I, just to make it clear for myself, we need to, need just want to declare, you need to wait on approval before purchasing laptops. Um, no, uh, actually, you can, you can, you, you mean approval, you mean getting your application for the ECF approved before you actually buy anything? Um, no, you can buy something ahead of time. The window's only open to August, so there's that to consider. Um, but if you buy something, if you're like, you're ready to buy and you've already got this kind of organized July 1st, you can you know, make your purchases, that's no problem, and then apply for e um, ECF to cover those purchases you made. That is perfectly fine, so you don't have to wait. However, do understand that there is an approval process and there's a potential that you'll buy some laptops and then get denied for some reason for the ECF funding. So that's something you'd need to weigh. How risky is it? But um, you do not need to wait to, um, to buy the laptops, no. Um, you will need to keep receipts and invoices and things to, and this is one thing that we do not have all the details on that I wish we did, but it, they're working on it. There will be some documentation you will have to provide showing here's the invoices, here's what we bought, um, here's you know how we're lending them out, that kind of thing, but that's, you know, to be to be learned, but keep keep your paperwork. <laughs> um, oh, good question, Celine. How do you control if they use the laptop in the library? You yeah, good question. Can you? You can tell them it, when you check out. This is something that is a requirement in the FCC um, order is that when a student or when anyone takes one of these devices, they are going to have to sign an agreement um, of your use policies, and it states what it is to be used for. Um, and so they will be signing off on this document every time they check it out that it, they, they know these are the rules and this is what it's to be used for. So ideally that should, and then, you know, when you explain it to them, you say, we have these computers and they're for this purpose. You can take them home, you can take them to the park, you can take them to <laughs> wherever you're doing your work that's not here. Um, we're trying to help you, you know, when we're not available, when the library is closed, you need to have something to do to, somewhere um, a way to use the internet and, and a device, um, or if you just want to be home rather than sitting in our parking lot. Uh, so as far as controlling if they use it, unless you want to walk around and double check everyone in your building and saying, where'd you get that laptop? That'd be on you, up to you to decide, but you will have to have them sign a document every time saying we understand what the use uh, use rules are for this particular laptop. 
and then you know however you guys decide to be how strict you guys decide to be about it um <laughs> Ah, Karen, yes. If you purchase laptops now with this money, can you later, say three to five years later, decide to use them in-house? Um, yes, future use of them beyond the COVID-19 panda pandemic is, would be totally up to you. Yes, I believe, oh, let me, there is, I think there is something of, really specific. I got some cheat sheets here of networks. I want to make sure that I, if I have this info, that I get it right to you. Envisioning applications to public funding. Equipment. Hmm. I think there was something about a three-year use, and then after that you can do what you want. But I can't find it on this little short sheet here. But um, I'll say, yeah, at some point, yes, you can do whatever you want with it. Um, I can double check the exact timing, but um, yes, down the road, of course, you, yes, you can. Um, there is something there that you can use it for your, whatever you need for. Um, like I said, like a lot of things that are coming out now with money and whatnot, it's in response to the pandemic. When the pandemic's over, things all change. Yes. Um, oh, Jeannie asked about the service plans that some are three years long. That's true. Um, this money is just for, it would be just for the first year though. Um, and you would have to then after that cover this, the, the cost. You're, you're welcome to sign up for a three-year plan, but this money will only cover it through the end of June of next year. Um, Good question, Donna. Okay, um, if we buy laptops just to be used as laptops and not connected to the internet, do we have to ask the need question? Um, yes, for all of the anything that comes from the ECF, the Emergency Connectivity Fund, it is um, in re because there's a need. The person has a need. So yes, it's it, it's that's a need and SIP, but that's two different things. So yes, anything that you purchase with this money, you will have to have um, them sign a document stating that I am needy, and they don't have to say what their need is. But yes, I haven't. I am not able to have my own laptop, my own internet connection. Um, but if it's just even just laptops that you're lending out that comes from this money, yes, you, they'd have to sign off on that. Yes, I have the need that you're stating is. A, a valid need and um, they will have to sign off on something that says that yes that's the whole purpose of the emergency connectivity fund is there is a need that isn't being fulfilled and we're going to try and help cover that whether it's for the internet connection itself or just having the physical device Yeah, good question. Yes. Is the wording for that coming or do we go our own way? You mean like what do I write up in this piece of paper in this document? Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, uh, we're looking for some of that. That's actually questions that are going along around right now with some of the other um, E-rate coordinators like myself. Um, I help our libraries supply for E-rate. Um, we're the ones because you know, USAC is doing this program, we're helping you guys do it, are amongst ourselves trying to figure out is there wording for that? Has anybody drafted anything yet? Um, I don't have anything in hand yet, but we will work on getting something. I'm hoping too that we will have more clarification from USAC on what needs to be in those documents. That's one thing we actually don't have is here's a list of what it has to say when you do ask them, you know, have them sign off on it. Um, that's something they have, have not provided to us yet either. So we're kind of still in limbo right now on um, what USAC thinks needs to be in them. Um, typically FCC orders are more broad and vague, just saying here's generally what we want to have happen. And then USAC figures out all the day-to-day -day nitty gritty. And we're still waiting on some of that day-to-day -day nitty gritty information. So yes, we will try and provide you some samples and what other libraries have put together, um, but we just don't have it yet. Uh, like I said, it's all new. We don't even have access to looking at seeing, and we're not going to have, they are actually told us this, we will not have a preview of what these forms look like or what the, um, uh, the 
ECF portal looks like before it opens the before the window opens next Tuesday. They're just they have already said you'll just see it when it's open. No pre-planning. That's okay. You know, you got 45 days to look at it and figure it out. So we have time. And I will be here looking at it for you and getting anything and everything I can from USAC to help you guys apply for this and know exactly what you're supposed to do. Cool. All right. All right. So there is some, there are some things you can do now. Um, the window doesn't open until next Tuesday to actually apply, but there is some prep work that you can do and you will need to do before you can apply um, and even use the form, and you can do that right now. Uh, so to get ready to participate, uh, and I'm going to get into the details of each of these on separate on more slides explaining more. So there's some numbers you need to have, some you might already have, some places you need to register and sign up in. Um, and you can do all of this right now before the window opens. And we recommend you to get on top into doing this as soon as possible because there is some, some of it does take some time to have it done. And you will need to have all of these things done before you can actually go in and do that um, emergency con connectivity fund 471 form. You have to have all these done and you can start working on them right now. So FCC registration number, having an EPIC and ECF portal account, um, a DUNS number, and signing up at the SAM.gov website. And I'm going to explain all of that now. <laughs> so FCC registration numbers, um, anyone who does business with the FCC has to have one of these, and they ask for it. Um, if you've done been doing E-rate, you already have one, and it's already in your um, account information because um, they've been requiring that for quite a few years. Um, you may already have one of these at your, even if you're not doing E-rate, your library may also have one of these and you just don't know it. I've had many libraries who didn't realize that their city or their library had, uh, had already been assigned one of these, just because at some point they had done some sort of business with the FCC regarding money and um, had one set up for them. So there is a website you can go to, it's called the CORES website, um, that you can look up your FCC registration number. It's one link to go to, to both look up, see if you have one, and if it doesn't come up with anything for you, go ahead and apply for one. So you will need to set up one of those numbers. Um, the first step one is setting up and getting a registration number or checking to see if you have one. If your library has one already. The second step is having, a, so many acronyms, EC, EPC, ECF account. All right, let's explain this. The E-Rate Productivity Center is the portal, the online location where people, um, libraries and schools go to apply for E-Rate funding. Um, they are, USAC is basing the new um, emergency connectivity fund portal on the E-Rate portal, um, the EPIC portal. That's what EPC is actually pronounced, EPIC. Um, it's going to be a separate login, though, a whole separate place to go to. So those of you that do E-Rate, you're not going to log into your same place. You're going to have a whole new place to go to to log in. But if you are a current E-Rate participant, you're going to use whatever your current E-Rate login is. Whatever you use to log into Epic now, you, you, you just go ahead and use it on the ECF portal when it's ready next week. If you have never done E-Rate before and you don't have anything set up in that, the way they're doing this is they're having you get a an... Um, E-Rate Productivity Center account. That's where they're holding everybody's profile info in the EPIC system. And then you'll be able to go into the ECF system using that info to do your applications. So if you're brand new and have never done anything with E-Rate, you will have to set up an EPIC account for yourself. Um, and then USAC will take all the EPIC accounts and transfer them into the ECF portal for everyone to use them there to apply for this new fund. It sounds weird and confusing and and what why why can't it? yeah but that's just how they set it up behind the scenes <laughs> like i said this is a brand new thing arp is brand new they had to kind of scramble and they are scrambling like crazy to just make this work and this is the easiest way they could figure out they have a way in epic already the e-rates productivity center to set up accounts we'll use that existing uh programming the existing space to do that and then we'll just put everybody into and then we'll just transform over into the new portal we've created quickly for the emergency connectivity fund so it sounds a little weird you're going to be if you're new to this setting up as if you're going to do e-rate but you're not going to do e-rate you're just going to use that to get this going and then you use the ecf to get a new one set up unlike many things on the internet you don't go to a website and just sign up yourself you have to call them <laughs> on the phone 
is you're gonna have to talk to somebody and they have an 800 number specifically set up for the emergency connectivity um, funding. So this is a number specifically to anything related to ECF. So, and that's the 800 number there, 800-234-9781. It's available right now. They're open 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. Eastern time, if I recall that correctly. And um, so you can call right now and have them set you up with um, an Epic account that will then be transferred automatically into the um, ECF portal. You will need this FCC registration number before you call them to set up your account. So if that's why I've got these in this order. Step one, you've got to get this number. Step two, are you already E-rate? You're good to go. If you're not set up an E-rate, call with all your library info and that FCC registration number and have them set you up with the E-rate Productivity Center account. That will then be what you will use to do your ECF account. Yes, and exactly. If you have a current Epic account, it will just automatically be transferred into the ECF portal and you'll just use that same login credentials to log into the ECF portal that you use now to log into the Epic portal. So current E-rate people don't have to do anything. Just hopefully the idea is next Tuesday, you can log in using whatever you currently use to do E-rate into the new ECF portal. Fingers crossed that everything will work. <laughs> so third thing you need is a Dunn's number. Uh, another thing used to do business, Dunn and Bradstreet uh, Data Universal Numbering System. Um, this is something that's required to have, um, if anyone is required to register with the federal government for contracts or grants, which is what this kind of money is for, um, is required to have one of these numbers. Um, all of this is one time thing too, so don't get who overwhelmed. Just do all this stuff once and then you're done. <laughs> um, you can check and see they've got two separate websites on the um, Dun and Bradstreet webpage uh, website. One to look up and see if you already have one of these. Same kind of thing as the FCC. You might have one, you just didn't know. Um, and if you don't have one, where you can apply to get one. Um, this is all done online, pretty easy. Uh, generally, the FCC registration number and the DUNS number comes pretty quickly. Um, not even a few days, um, it's all done online. Um, but you will need one of these in order to do the um, emergency connectivity fund. And then the last thing you need to set up is an account in SAM.gov. This is the System for Award Management. Um, and this is the official US government website for anyone that is receiving your support from the US government. This is where all the funding is gonna actually filter through. Um, and this is where you give them all of your, your um, all this funding is, uh, if it's being sent to you directly, it's done as like a direct deposit electronic payment they don't send, USAC doesn't do checks or mailing out checks or anything anymore. Everything is done electronically. This is where you will um, provide your banking information so that they know where to send the funding to. Um, this one can take time. And this is the one that USAC is saying, get onto this ASAP because it can take more than a week to get this register set up. Um, until you have this set up, no funding can be sent to you. So you definitely need this. You need all those previous three things I just mentioned too, but this is the one that takes can take time. Um, they said more than a week. It can take a couple of weeks, it depends. Um, uh, so, you know, do all these things you've been doing and definitely get on top of doing this one. Now, you can apply for your um, March, you can submit that, um, 471 for the emergency connectivity fund before this is all done. That's okay. It's just you won't get the money until you've gotten this done. So even if you just start working on this and you haven't received your confirmation that your SAM.gov account is set up, it's okay to submit your 471 like next week and at least get that in um, while this is still processing. That's fine. Um, you just have to wait until you get confirmation that this your SAM.gov is set up and then they will be able to uh, send the money to you. Oh, it's a, well, that's an interesting question, Cecily. <laughs> is there a wrong way to apply to SAM? Um, have you had problems with that? Is that why you're <laughs> asking or you're 
Yeah, uh, I uh, applied last Friday, and I like I I did it properly. Like I got through the whole thing, but uh-huh. I, you know there are just some parts of it that I wasn't sure if I answered it correctly, if I'm like selected the right type of entity. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, there, there. I mean, it's it's really long, and there it took me like an hour to do it, and then all of these things that kept coming up and um, like the, you know, the different parts of it, I just wasn't sure if those were the correct answers. So, I mean, I registered, I made my way through it, but uh, you know, is there anything I need to look out for or? I don't uh, see, uh, this is new to me too. Um, this SAM.gov is something we've never had to do with E-rate before. So it's, the, this money is coming in a different way than E-rate usually comes to USAC. That's something that um, is something to understand too. And that's why there's these different things you have to sign up for. Um, the way it's been being allotted, distributed to them works differently. That's why we have to be in this um, uh, system. Um, I would say if you did something wrong, they'd, they'd let you know. You'll receive some sort of confirmation saying, yes, it, it worked, or no, it didn't. Um, they will send a confirmation. So if something was missing, <laughs> um, they will they should let you know. Uh, I know that. Uh, I actually do have, and I, I think what I will um, I'll send that all out to you guys when I send you the information about the recording and everything. We do have a guide to signing up for a SAM.gov account that's provided to us by our um, IMLS person. Um, This is because those of you may have heard, we at the Library Commission also have funding from ARPA that we are going to be distributing to all of you. In order for you all to get it, you're gonna need the SAM.gov account for that as well. Um, So I do have a uh, step-by-step guide that I will, um, we're we're going to be putting it up with our ARPA page that we're working on, it's coming. Promise. Um, but I can, it, it's needed for this too. I will send that out as part of the um, ECF stuff. So you can see what are the steps. And you can confirm and see did you do the right things or not. Um, but like I said, they send a confirmation to you and letting you know if it's been set up. So I would assume if something didn't go through correctly or they're confused, they'll reach out to you and, and you'll, you'll find out if you need something. Um, Well, if, okay, here's a good question for Katie. My city clerk just notified us that she has set up a SAM account for the city. Does the library need to have a separate account? Um, the account needs, there needs to be an account for wherever the, whatever bank account you want the money to go into. So that's kind of the way to think of it. If, and, and in the SAM, as it says here on the slide, you're going to enter into the SAM account, the actual bank account number and routing number that the money will go into. So if it is supposed to go into a city account and then they distribute it to the library for its use, then you would use the cities. If it's a whole different bank account that the library has that you wanna use to have this money go into, um, the library's own bank account, or in many cases, libraries have this kind of funding go into a um, a friends or foundation account instead, then you'd need to set up the the, the SAM.gov that does that. So it's the key is where is this money gonna finally end up uh, will determine whether or not you need something separate from what the city has or not. Um, and as you can see here, to register for this account, you need that DUNS number that you've already applied for. You need um, a taxpayer ID number or employee ID m- number. This is numbers you can get from your city or your HR, um, something you'd already have, and then all your bank account info to set up that electronic funding in for that direct deposit. And once it is done, as we said, this one that can take more than a week, you'll get a confirmation email so you know that your registration is good to go. Oh, good question, Anne. Hmm, okay. Um, the question Anne has, if we are using a village entity tax ID number or employment ID number, do we set up a DUNS number for the library or the village? Um, I would say make it match. Um, well, it depends if the library uses the villages. I don't think, honestly, I don't know that it matters. I've seen libraries that have their own DUNS number and then because of how their accounting and finances work, they use the villages ID numbers and it hasn't been an issue. Um, 
I check and see uh, when we, when you look in that Duns website to look up and see if there's a number that exists already. You can look up your village. Um, you'll look up just by the name of the village and, and see is there anything already in there that you could use. Um, yeah, so having different names is okay. Really, all that USEC wants to know is who is the end entity that gets the money. <laughs> Um, and that's what this, the key of this is. Where does the money need to end up? In, in what billing entity? That the li you know, the library is the one getting the service and the device, but where does the the money end up or come from? Is is the key at the other end? And it's okay if it's different. Yeah, for E-rate, we've got many some libraries that it's all the villages info because that's where the money goes, and that's perfectly fine. Yes. All right. All right. G says, does this money have to be a part of the library budget for the upcoming year? Um, honestly, that would be up to you. Uh, we try to recommend, we, we like at the library commission, I'm talking now. Um, this kind of money is, we consider this as extra money something in addition to your regular library budget, the city should still support the library and still, you know, keep, you know, providing the same support it has. Um, this is ex like, uh, grants we give out other, you know, over the years, any grants is, is you, we try to, you know, think of it as it's extra money if you do something you couldn't normally do with your current budget, not a replacement for that budget, no. Um, however, we understand that this past year has not been normal and budgets have been cut, and that is the purpose for a lot of these, this new funding is to help make up for those budget cuts. Um, the tax revenues have gone, have been less, and so there's less money for everybody to go around. And this may be something that gets your budget back up. Um, I would try not to, the, 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 the the problem can happen is if you say, hey, we have this big chunk of money for laptops, let's put that in our library budget. This is a one-time deal though. Next year, what happens with that chunk of money that you had in your budget for the, you said you had this money, it no longer is gonna exist in a future year. So you don't wanna see, you know, then you suddenly lose that money, that amount of your budget because the money no longer is out there. So the fact that this is a one-time deal, it's not a regular thing that you can depend on every year. You know, like we give you guys state aid money every year, you can pretty much depend on that and you know it's coming. This is not that kind of situation. I wouldn't want you to kind of risk your budget being cut permanently because you put this into it as a big amount and then, well, it's only for one year, it's a one-time thing. So kind of gotta think about that. Ah, yes, Celine, lots of questions. <laughs> all right, I'm going to rattle off these questions. I do not have all the answers to these, but this is something that we've had other libraries. I'm talking about hotspots. She's questioning, Celine's asking about hotspots. Celine Grinnelly. How much are hotspots? Where do you get them? Do you have to buy cases for them? If lost, does the patron have to pay for a replacement? So many questions. Absolutely. Um, hotspot lending programs are um, a big thing to get into if you've never done it before. We do have a few libraries here in Nebraska who have um, done it, um, have been doing it previously or have done it through using our, we did the CARES Act grants last year. So um, I can give you some names of information about some other libraries who've already done this. Uh, I know Norfolk did it. Think Beatrice. I'm trying to think off the top of my head, of course. Um, you can get them from places like what uh, Karen mentioned. Mobile Beacon offers them. Verizon, um, your ser general service providers have will send, you know do will will sell you you know 20 hotspots and the service for a year as a package deal. Um, that's an that's an option. I don't know about cases for hotspots. I know cases for laptops. Does anybody know if hotspots do cases too? Um, and if it's lost, does the patron have to pay for it? That would be your policy. How do you deal with anything that patrons lose or, or damage? Um, the FCC does understand that th that will happen over the lifetime of these, and that's perfectly fine. Just keep records of what happened if something got lost or damaged or went missing, just like anything else that you lend out. Um, but that would be uh, based on your policies for that, anything that you lend. Does anybody have any um, tips for Celine about how much a hotspot does cost, where you get them? How, have, have any of you done this already?
like I said, I know we had some of our CARES Act grants went out for that purpose um, for libraries to do it brand new or for libraries who had been doing it and just wanted to expand because people weren't coming in, kid couldn't come to the library, so they needed the internet at home. Ah, Tammy says some libraries charge a $50 deposit um, at checkout as a like just in case you, something happens to it. That could be something you could do to help just in case something, yep. Or you could have, I mean, when you check these out, you could have rules for how they get used. And it, just like anything, you know, I'm sure you've got policies for if you damage this book, if your dog pees on it or whatever happens, here's, what's, here's what you'll be responsible for. You just have to set up the same kind of thing for the, the hotspots and the laptops. All right, we've got about 10 minutes left officially. But as I said, I will answer any questions you have as long as it takes here. Um, the last few slides I have are about um, training and websites and everything and what's coming for that. Um, any other questions you have about, before I get to that last bit, about the Emergency Connectivity Fund, about uh, what you can apply for, how can you apply, as much as I know right now. Um, any little things that you're curious about. Go ahead and type in the question section if you want to talk like like this leaded I can unmute you um, let's see you got stuff coming here sorry I'm reading this question and thinking about it okay all right so Donna has another question about SIPA if we purchased a laptop and a hotspot only for staff to use at a pop-up site. That set would need a filter, but not the whole library system of computers. Correct, because um, you're just at that particular location. Um, yes. You're not getting um, ECF or E-rate funding to get the library's internet connection to start with. It's just that outside computer, that's the one that would need it, yes, but you don't suddenly have to filter the whole, yeah. I can't see if you guys are typing like in something, so if you are typing something and I'm, and I'm waiting for it to come through. So I'm gonna just give another second here, a minute or so for anyone has any questions that you wanna get answered now before I talk about training and how to keep up on new things coming out about this. As I said, I'll just chat a little bit here while I'm waiting to see if anybody has any questions. Um, I wish I did have actual, my eyes on the forms themselves, because I know a lot of people, that's what I know I'm getting lots of questions on is what is in the form? What do I need to apply? How does that actually work? Next Tuesday, we'll all find out. Um, hopefully with some of the basics about what the program is that I started. Um, I can tell you this though, the forms, the E-rate forms online that these are being based on are some of the easiest, simplest ones, some really basic info, uh, very nice slick online system that they're based on. Um, and these are modified versions because there is less they need, uh, less, less information for this than for the full E-rate program. So I think it should be too, okay. <laughs> ah, yes, Tammy, please repeat the final application date. Yes, the application filing window opens next Tuesday and closes on August 13th. So that is for this first filing window. So August 13th is your ultimate deadline for applying for this. And hopefully we'll have more money left over afterwards and there'll be another window that will open up or potentially retroactive. All right, let's go on to the last few slides I have here. So training, um, people wanna know how does this all work? How do I use this? Um, those of you who've gone to E-rate trainings, you know I usually do a lot of screenshots showing you how to do everything. As I said, don't have any of that. Um, but USAC is doing, um, they are doing a slightly different thing. They are not even themselves doing any live training sessions on this. 
on the um, Emergency Connectivity Fund. They're creating self-paced e-learning modules. Um, they're not available yet, at least not as of this morning when I looked. <laughs> um, and they're on the Emergency Connectivity Fund website on the training section. I've given, I've got you the um, URL here. So this will be where you'll do your own self-paced training. There will be, um, you know, different um, videos and things you can go through to with screenshots and I assume demos of actually doing it. Uh, but there will be online training that they will have that will show that. Um, that uh, coming soon. So keep an eye on their website, keep an eye on their announcements. Um, they also are going to have weekly office hours where you can call into them for um, with any questions you may have specific to um, your application, anything you're wondering or wanting to know about. Um, you're welcome to call me, of course, um, with any questions you have, but you also can call them at that customer support number that they have. And this is the number specifically for the um, emergency connectivity fund. If you do E-rate, there's a different number for E-rate related questions. So um, they have set up a whole separate set of people, a whole separate support center specifically just for the Emergency Connectivity Fund, completely separate from the uh, support center and the call-in people that you don't call to talk to about E-rate. So if you call this number, 800-234-9781, um, they'll just be there to answer your ECF questions. Um, and it is Monday through Friday, 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. Eastern time that that is available. Um, uh, also, uh, to keep up on what's going on, um, I will try and push out as much information as I know, of course, through our as I have been through our um, blog and system mailing lists and everything. Um, but uh, check out their the website for the Emergency Connectivity Fund. Uh, they will be adding things to it regularly. Um, they have been doing. They started last week doing uh, their own one hour. Well, officially one hour webinars with a very high level overviews. Um, not a lot of specifics and detail, but letting people know they're doing multiple webinars um, at different times. Um, at least one of them is now up as a recording. So if you want to see what USAC said, um, I'll, I'll own up right now. A lot of my presentation here is just borrowed from theirs. <laughs> so you'll see a lot of, you know, they're the experts, they're the officials in charge of this. So I depend on them for all of my information to give to you along with some other um, resources I have. Um, but you can, you're welcome to watch their recordings if you want to. Um, they um, also have a specific newsletter and emails are sent out that are specifically about the Emergency Connectivity Fund. I signed up for that and I got a notification about these webinars they have. So if you want to, that's a web uh, URL to go to to sign up and get those notifications yourself. Ooh, that link should continue to that Emergency Connectivity Fund bit in the bottom there. I'll fix that so it makes it an actual correct hot link before I send this out. Um, and also the FCC has just announced they are going to be doing a webinar tomorrow at 1 p.m. Central Time. Um, I did change that one to Central Time. Um, if you wanted to hear what they have to say about this program and ask them any questions. Uh, they um, did specify um, general questions. Uh, not They won't be answering a lot of specific to your situation questions because it's, you know, Going to be a huge event, but um, I'm going to be attending it to see um, just to see what they actually say. Um, as I've been watching these webinars and having this, you know these events talking about it, things have changed because uh, as, as the USAC is uh, creating more of the background database and getting things going, and we're learning more about it, and you, you learn more information. So um, hopefully it won't be drastically different from what I'm telling you today, <laughs> but um, you, you may want to check in on the FCC webinar tomorrow afternoon. Um, and keep an eye on that Emergency Connectivity Fund website on actually under the training link there. That's where they are posting any web other um, actual webinars they're doing. In addition to these e-learning modules, which are the tra real training trainings, their quickie webinars are listed there and the recordings of them are listed on that training part of their um, ECF website. So keep checking back there to see if new ones available there. Okay. Uh, okay. So um, I will be sending you all a copy. Of, you all have access to this um, PowerPoint presentation afterwards. So don't worry about trying to scribble down all these links. You'll have them um, when you get this after when the recording is available. Um, and then um, lastly, there's my co my contact info. You guys all know where to find me, of course. But just in case, there's the 800 number here for the Library Commission and my email address. 
All right, so anybody have any questions? Um, we are just at 11.59, it says on my clock here, but I did start at about five after 10, um, the official start time for this, and that's okay. Um, but as I said, I will answer any questions you have right now. We don't have to cut off. So if you have any questions you wanna ask me, go ahead and get it in, type it in here, and I will um, keep going until we have any everything you um, ask answered. And I'm looking at a question that did come in here from Don, let's see. Have there been any reports of what is happening with IMLS funding not used in their individual funds? As you just mentioned, with ECF money may have around two billions of dollars is hard to spend. It is. Um, yeah, 7.1 billion is a huge amount. Um, I don't know. The, the, uh, the IM, IMLS actually has its own grants that they're giving out as well that libraries can apply for. In addition to the money they gave us as a state library agency to give you money grants for, um, there's a lot of money going out there. Um, I don't know about what's happening with IMLS funds that haven't been used. Um, I do know there is some, we don't know what's going to happen with this 7.1 billion from this emergency connectivity fund. And it'd be interesting to see. Some people are concerned that the schools who have, as I mentioned earlier, you have 500 students, I want 500 tablets and I want 500 laptops and that every school is gonna buy one for every one of their students and every one of their staff and the money is just gonna disappear, so poof, and it will actually all go out and there will be nothing left for another round or for libraries. Um, I honestly don't know, um, USAC has not told us about also their priority prioritization of who how the funding will be um, awarded. So that's something, you know, if you know with E-Rate, it's, um, there's discount levels and sometimes prioritization. There's no information yet from USAC about that. Um, so some people think the billions of dollars will go like that. And some people think no way we can, we can ever spend this at all. <laughs> Until the applications start coming in, we won't know. It is a lot of money. <laughs> Anybody have any other last minute desperate questions you want to ask of me? Oh. I'm gonna stop the sharing for a second here and switch over. Go ahead and get them typed into your questions section. And I'm just going over here. There we go. I wanted to show you the Emergency Connectivity Fund website, the main site to keep an eye on. Um, oh, not yet. Yes, I know. I'm sure you will have questions, and that's, that's like you've got my contact info. Whatever. If you can't think of things now, that's fine. Call, email me with any questions you do come up with as you start getting into applying for this. Um, feel free also to reach out directly to you to USAC at their um, number as well that's perfectly fine um, and we'll all work through this together um, but this is the um, website for the program it's definitely the main place to keep on an eye on things and this is um, specifically for the emergency connectivity uh, fund um, they've got some basic info as you can see here coming soon getting started with the program <laughs> um, they have about the program information about the dates, what you're asking, Tammy, June 29th to August 13th. That is your filing window. Um, what about eligibility? The application process right now is just some general information. As I said, there is no details, specifics yet. Um, if you look at the homepage here, they do have a kind of a, here are the steps that we'll go through, but no specifics yet because um, the window and the form not being open for people to look at. But similar process is the rate you apply. Um, it'll be reviewed, they'll make a decision, and then you'll get your funding. Uh, the resources they have here, the training that I was talking about, this is where those e-learning modules will be. As you can see, nothing is linked yet, coming soon. Uh, the webinars I attended last week and actually this week are under what they call their live sessions. 
so you can see what they have upcoming and here's recordings of previous ones they did they did a general overview and they did one specifically for tribal applicants so um with some focusing on what tribal libraries may need to know and then they do have a link here to that same thing that the fcc is doing a webinar tomorrow um there's there's this isn't a thing you read you don't have to register for the fcc one it is just you go to the web page and when it starts and just start watching it on their the FCC's live streaming page that they have. So you just kind of put it in your own calendar at one o'clock p.m. Central Time tomorrow. I should go to this page and start watching what they're presenting, and it will be about the Emergency Connectivity Fund. Uh, and then there is the link here to sign up for that newsletters, the link that I put in your PowerPoint, and then they also have the uh, phone number where you can reach them. Once you do, and this is something actually they do mention this here, you know, right now you call the 800 number, but once you do have that emergency connectivity fund portal set up, there will be a way within that system to send questions and, and um, contact uh, USAC and to ask questions about it. Um, until you have access to that next Tuesday, you don't, it's not available though. Right now, you just gotta call the phone number. And for those of you who are not current E-rate, you have to call the phone number to get set up for the first, get that account set up in the first place. That is the only way to get this portal set up is to call that 800 number. All right. Doesn't look like anybody has any other questions you've typed in, so I think we'll wrap it up for our webinar this morning. Uh, thank you everybody for being here today. I hope this was helpful and not too confusing. <laughs> um, and it will uh, get some of you to try out and see if you wanna apply for this funding next week. Um, uh, go to it, try it out, get those things set up that you need to do to get ready. Um, start doing that right away so you have all those steps done and all those numbers and registrations in SAM.gov all ready and good to go. Um, um, and then we'll see what comes next week. Um, when the recording is ready, I will um, we're gonna figure out where we're going to post this on our website. And I will send everybody who attended this today and everybody who registered for today's session an email to let you know that it's ready for you to watch if you do have um, need to uh, rewatch anything that I said here. Um, I think what I will do, though, I'm going to proactively email you all the PowerPoint and that SAM.gov guide that I mentioned I have so you have that right away. So I'll do that as soon as we're done here. All right, let me know if you have any other questions or comments or um, anything, uh, and good luck. Bye.